Hello and welcome to The Inquisitive Friend. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings interviews and insights from all walks of life on the reality of being. Today, I welcome Dr. Kristen Donnelly, who's an award-winning four-time TEDx speaker. She's an international empathy educator, author, and researcher with over two decades of experience. I've always found the topic of empathy quite interesting and controversial in some ways. And one of the reasons why I started this podcast during lockdown, which many podcasts were born during that time, uh, is because I'm always open to learning, learning from others, others who have experience and opinions, and those opinions and experiences will often be very different from my own. And I invite those onto the show to talk about their area of expertise. And even though through my work as a therapist, we deal in empathy with empathy, not always, it just depends. It's not always a topic as such, but it's certainly a component into how we relate to other people. And through my work and my life, I've often found people who appear to have a deep level of interest in other people, wanting to understand other people, and open an acceptance of people who may have different opinions, different thoughts than their own, inviting. And those are the people I've been drawn to. If you've listened to any of the shows where whereby I've invited people who I've known for years, you will see this level of empathy between us. And those people are like-minded, I suppose, in some way. But I also have friends who are quite, have different personalities. Some may even describe them as strict or dogmatic. And that can be interesting as well. However, what I have found is that even though they they may have that as dominant personality traits, the core of their being is empathy. The core of their being is to listen, to take it on board. Now, they may interrupt at times and say, no, that's not right, which I can do as well. But the core of what they bring is a level of openness to hear, to understand, to empathize. And I suppose that's why I was interested in interviewing my guest today. Dr. Kristen Donnelly is an award-winning four-time TEDx speaker. She's in, she's a researcher. She's an international empathy educator, and she has over two decades of helping people to understand the beauty of difference and the power in inclusivity. And I believe that you can't be inclusive without empathy. If we can understand the plight of a nation, of a person, of a group, we can we can identify areas within our own personalities where we are empathetic. The interview was fascinating and I learned so much because working spiritually as well, some of the energies I've connected with and people who I've helped over the years through spiritual guidance, connections as a medium, I have found that not everyone has empathy. And I would have to say that through my own work as well, which we touch upon, that people can lack empathy. Uh, There's a, a lack of understanding. And I often wondered, and I have sometimes believed, that empathy cannot be learned. But Kristen explains a way in which it can be learned. So throughout the years, I've researched, I've looked up papers, and actually the British Psychological Society, of which I'm a member, I saw an article years ago about empathy and how sometimes 
you know, I think people may get it mixed up that it is uh, either positive or negative because you can still feel, you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, but it doesn't mean you'll act upon it. You might feel for a cause, but it doesn't mean you'll donate or advocate for that cause or, you know, sponsor the cause in some way or tell people about it. And you can feel, you can understand or feel that a person is suffering, but it doesn't mean you will be kind to them. I've seen it happen. And people may go, "Uh uh-huh, yes, okay, I get it. But this, but do this, do that, or sorry, still not going to help, still going to be mean, still going to bully, still going to do this, do that. So they may understand the plight of racism, for instance, but it doesn't alter their behavior. And so it did prompt me years ago in looking up research regarding this topic. And what I did find, and some of it we touch upon, is you know, obviously the brain works in a particular way and the amygdala. So it's all down to executive functioning, really. So the amygdala, we're talking about the way in which we may be able to stifle uh, or respond to other people's emotions or stifle our responses to emotions, which happens when people lack empathy. And it may be too, and I know more research is being done, especially with MRI studies, which I'm always interested in, to looking at through scans, how the brain responds when you're empathetic. Uh, but it doesn't mean, it, you know, empathy is not, empathy is not positive or negative. It's amoral. I believe that it's, um, it, it can be a candidate for good, but it can also Perhaps, you know, we see negative causes, so it can be a candidate for harm. So people may understand a a terrorist group. Um, And so rather than empathize for the people who they harm, they may empathize for the actual group itself. So that's where my thoughts go with positive or negative. And, you know, if you've, if you've watched any of the shows as well, it, whenever I talk about positivity, I've seen some of it be very, very toxic. And so we try and steer from that. But Kristen, so Kristen did help to shed light on how she works with empathy. But we also talk about burnout, which, you know, is a cultural issue. And is it a cultural issue? And she does give some very helpful, very interesting insights into that. And, you know, Kristen shed some light on working in different countries, and she's got lots of experience with that, and how people behave in different cultures, and what we were taught, and what we believe, and some of it's very natural for us to believe a certain way or feel guilt. And so a lot of her research, she she works with the Good Doctors of Abbey Research. It's a company that she owns and she's a co-founder and they work with research around this topic. It's very fascinating stuff. She's also been in Forbes, uh, Thrive Global, and she has a best-selling book which she co-authored called The Cultural Burnout, Why Your Exhaustion is Not Your Fault. And so I I encourage you all, as you listen to this today, to really open your hearts and minds to find that snippet of empathy. Some of you will be overflowing with empathy. And, you know, I touch upon that in a spiritual way where a lot of people find empathy overwhelming. They feel everything, which can be stifling in itself. If you're feeling and open to everything, it can affect your emotions, it can cause depression, it can cause overexcitement, hyperactivity, which isn't going to be always helpful within your everyday life. All research, especially this research, is very important in helping us to understand each other as human beings, how we are the way we are, why we are the way we are, 
and what needs to be changed, what can be helped, because everything we do each and every day, I believe, has an effect on the macro, the bigger change. It has an effect on universal energy. It's a snippet, but it's a ripple effect. And you may not even be aware of how your own beliefs, your thoughts, influence and dictate how you respond, how open you are, how closed you may be to other people. And we're all human. And people think that because maybe you have a degree or you work in a particular role, that you may not have these problems, but we're all human, which is what this podcast is about. And this is the reality of being. So please join me in welcoming Kristen Donnelly. Kristen, welcome. Really nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, gosh, thank you so much for having me, Sha. It's an honor. Well, I mean, you do some really interesting work, um, and a lot of it's based around empathy and burnout. So yep. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, your thoughts about empathy, what it is, because there's a lot of research out there that talks about how empathy is not necessarily always positive. It can be, you can be empathetic in a negative way as well, um, like siding with the prisoner, those kinds of things, or um, or with the siding with the serial killer, understanding, putting yourself in their shoes, that kind of thing. So what is empathy for our listeners out there? Well, the first thing for us to say, for for me to clarify, is that I'm coming at it from a social science perspective. My my doctorate is in sociology. My partner's doctorate is in anthropology. So there's lots of disciplines talking about empathy and lots of different perspectives in talking about empathy. For our money, you know, proverbially for our money, empathy is entirely about understanding. And because it's about understanding and not adopting, condoning, agreeing, any of those things, it's just about understanding. It actually can't be negative Mm -hmm. Um, because all you're doing is seeking to understand the other person to the best of your ability, which does a lot of things. First of all, it helps you understand what you can and cannot control, both about your own life, the world around you, and about the other person. We've also found the longer we've been teaching this and practicing it ourselves, um, our level of, I mean, it makes us get along with other people easier because you like someone's really frustrating. (laughs) You can just kind of say, I don't know what they're going through, or maybe this is happening. It really, what it does is increases curiosity. It leans into the natural curiosity we have as people that some of us have cultivated and some of us haven't. And so it encourages the cultivation of that curiosity. I wonder why my mate isn't calling me back. I wonder why this person cut me off in traffic. I wonder why, instead of assuming a whole lot of things, my mate isn't calling me back because they're a jerk or I did something wrong. This person cut me off in traffic because they're a terrible driver. Well, your mate might be having a bad day and that person might be rushing to a hospital. So there's lots of different things. really truly for as empathy is acknowledging that people are complicated and you're not a mind reader and so there it's it's asking more questions now all of that to say this means that it's possible to have empathy for difficult people for people whose actions are evil to to you and and in general societal belief (laughs) you know it it's it's possible to cognitively understand somebody's motivations, especially if they've been very clear about them. If someone has shown us who they are, we can believe them in the words of Dr. Angelou. And so empathy kind of takes some of that out because fundamentally, we don't think it's possible to truly know what someone else is feeling or to see the world from their perspective because you're always yourself. So you're always bringing your own baggage, lenses, histories, opinions into that situation. And the best you're doing is guessing how you would feel in their position. And so it still doesn't center the other person the way that empathy should and can. 
Excellent. Oh, I love that. And I really like the take, which is really in line with positive psychology or you know, listeners out there who are psychologists and that. Um, it's very, very much the positive side of it, positive psychology, which works. And I like how you put it about sort of just feeling or seeing, or understanding, understanding about people and that curiosity, as you say, just yeah. curious. I wonder what's going on there. You know, what do I, they have, where are they rushing off to? They almost knocked me over, you know, what's going on there? I love that standpoint um, because I think when you come from that standpoint, it immediately diminishes your judgments. You're just wondering. It does. And it makes life a lot less stressful. Um, and we found, so that, I mean, understanding academically researching empathy was our COVID lockdown project. My <laughs> partner and I, it's what we did during lockdowns um, because we noticed that, that there was becoming a real, you know, already we live in the United States. We lived in the United Kingdom for a while. The two of us, that's where we met. Erin is her name. Ireland, right? Um, we lived in Northern Ireland. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we've, those are, are fairly um, well-known divided societies, the United States and Northern Ireland. Like that's kind of things they're known for. And during lockdown, especially here in the Northeastern part of the United States, we saw things getting more and more bifurcated. And people having a harder, hard, a harder and harder time understanding each other and each other's perspectives. So we did a bit of a deep dive into what empathy is. And as we began to practice it, instead of getting angry that somebody didn't agree with us or didn't share our viewpoint or had an opposing, a diametrically opposed viewpoint that we believed was deeply wrong, this practice of understanding where they might be coming from, of understanding this is the context in which they grew up. And so that explains this possibly kind of doing all that mental acrobatics led to a lot less angst in our own lives. We were able to focus a lot of our emotional energy on things we could control and things that we had direct agency over instead of the kind of hyper anxiety that we all are programmed to have now because we carry fear machines around in our pockets, that it's a lot more focused energy than the energy that just says, everything is awful. You must be overwhelmed by all of it. You have to feel all of these things. You have to care about all of these things. Well, there's a difference between acknowledging that something is awful and caring about it kind of tangentially and investing all of your emotional energy to it. There's a difference, as you know, in your work as a, as a, as a therapist, there's a real difference. And in the last, I would say, you know, definitely, definitely five years, but even longer than that, we as Western societies have conflated those two things. That in order to care about something, you have to be completely invested in it and give all of your energy to it. A, that's not sustainable. <laughs> B, it doesn't do anything. It just, it doesn't do anything. I can be very informed and feel, you know, a certain way about a social issue and know what I can do to contribute to the solution of that issue, which is probably in some situations very little. And in other situations, a whole heck of a lot. And you can kind of, by practicing understanding, by asking more questions and making fewer assumptions about yourself, other people, and the world, you can practice a lot more of your own energy maintenance than you are if you're just trying to feel all the time, everything, everywhere. Right. So when you say, so that leads into my next question about can you learn empathy when you say practice it? What yes. are your thoughts about that learning to be empathetic? Well, if it's a cognitive thing, you know, hi, I'm an educator. I have a doc. Obviously, I like learning. I have a couple of postgraduate degrees <laughs> and I just kind of collect, collect learning. I believe that, and Aaron believes we both, our research shows and, and we believe deeply that empathy is a practice and therefore it is learned and practiced. And we tell stories all the time about, you know, we'll tr be traveling together and one of us will have, will say a statement that is super judgy. <laughs> and 
like really, really awful about another human being. And the other one will kind of look and catch the other person. And it's like, oh, bad empathy day. Like we're still human persons. We're still imperfect at this. It's still a practice. Um, so as we have kind of strengthen the muscle of understanding and curiosity, it's gotten a little bit easier, but there are still days and circumstances and people that will be texting each other and just be like, I can't, I can't with this. I can't, I can't, I got to tap out. Um, I feel this way. I, I kind of do these things, but yes, any cognitive, really, honestly, any human behavior can be learned and practiced. And, and the more you learn and practice it, the stronger that muscle becomes to make that, behavior innate rather than a decision. Mm. Such interesting research as well, um, because lockdown was one of those times in our lives that we will have that um, tested all empathy, all understanding, all patience, and you were yeah. forced to live with people 24 hours a day. <laughs> um, people hadn't realized things about people, all sorts of things, like the oh, children yeah. and all sorts, neighbors, it just, so that leads me into the other issue. I wanted to ask you your thoughts about, yeah, cognitive functioning. So we know the brain, you know, depending on executive functioning and other things, societal issues, um, how you were brought up. I mean, we could go on and on. Yeah. We know that some people may be predisposed to empathy, you know, empathetic parents, the uncle who was kind, the auntie who was loving and understanding and forgiving. But I wonder uh, in your research as well with the learning part, when we look at, and we're not going to delve deep into psychopathy or anything, but one of the things that shaped my practice early on was during the, um, my sort of just going into dealing with prisons and things like that. And I, I wondered about that early experience of understanding or patience, that bit that just pops in that says, no, wait, don't hit them, don't say that, don't, the bit that we all have, but some people can easily access it. And some people, I won't say it's not there, but we've got prisons full of people that say it's not there. Yeah. So, what are, what are your thoughts or have, has any of the research tapped into some of that and gracious that's a fascinating question I, I mean the the re like we don't have direct data about that and we're not neurobiologists we're not um we're not early childhood development psychologists the earliest my training into developmental psychology goes as adolescence oh um, and I do have some some training in that and a deep amount of interest we do a lot of generational research um and the the kind of understanding of you know as we always say about our university students like their baby brains aren't fully cooked <laughs> and so there's a there's a lot going on there but I'm not super familiar with early childhood development so with that caveat um I am a nature and nurture person so that it all of my life um experience and things that I've read um, I have done a lot of work with teenagers and young adults in recovery um, from various addictions. And one of the things that that more than I have with incarcerated individuals. So I'll say that I have very limited experience with incarceration. Um, but when I look at, when I work with and chat with people in recovery, both who have slipped in and out of it, some who have worked it for decades, something that I've, I've become convinced is that it's nature and nurture. That there are things that there are things in us that are wired certain ways. I mean, I'd be an idiot to not say that there's parts of our lives that are hardwired. Um, I have my father's temperament. <laughs> like that is I, anyone who knows my brother and I can see our dad come out sometimes and they'll be like, well, hello. <laughs> it's like, oh, so sorry. Yes. Hi, that's my dad. And we've all had that experience where it's like, oh, that's my aunt coming out of my mouth or that's my guardian coming out of my mouth. Like, oh my gosh, that isn't me. But as a, as a sociologist, I know that the culture we're raised in, the cultures we interact with throughout our lives shape so much of our behavior and how we see the world. So all of that to say, no matter what your nature gives you, I have seen humans reshape their nature so many times. And I, I fundamentally believe, I would not not be in this work, let me say that, if I did not believe that every human has the fundamental ability to change at any point in time, whatever they don't like about themselves. 
and whatever they wish was different about themselves. I do believe just from life experience that you have to want to change. You can't, you can't, no one else can will you to be different. Um, and we can also have the conversation that there's a lot of folks that don't have impulse control, but because they are born into more privileged circumstances, they will never see the inside of it of a of an incarceration um, situation. So it's messy and fascinating, and it's a great question. I don't have a lot beyond gut reaction to say that early childhood intervention is probably a real key to this, and the more we can expose children to to adults outside of their direct guardians and the more we can expose them to other cultural options than perhaps the one that they are um, directly with. I, I have the privilege of working with an international uh, organization that works on early childhood intervention um, and does and hires local teenagers actually to mentor the younger students and help them with education, help them with homework help and give them safe places to play after school and all these kind of things. And you watch the, you watch how different you are as a person, the more humans you meet when you're young, the more options you are shown, you can't be something you're not shown. You just, it, we need that. It's why representation in all levels of all industries and especially in media is so important. You can't be it if you're not shown it. Um, and so no matter how we're wired, the more options we are shown, the wider our circumstances can be, the wider our dreams and our aspirations and our direction can get, I think the more we have the capacity to change. Mm. Very promising. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> I, I got to get out of bed every morning for, for something. You know what I mean? Like if I believed we were all determined to do whatever, like why would I even do this work? I'd be an accountant. Well, but, um, you know, I got to believe people can change. Exactly that. And, you know, that helps with the question when in therapy, when we ask about child, that sometimes people go, do we have to talk about, my, you know, my child? We, do. <laughs> we have to. Yeah, maybe not today or we can put it off till next time. But yeah, yeah at some point, yes, very promising. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Um, but let's talk about burnout because I it's kind of all in a way connected if we're going to talk about learning things and and I wonder, as I was preparing for this, I was looking at a lot of your work and the research, which we're going to come on to as well. Um, but I was wondering too, I wonder if people burn out because they're not seeking work-life balance as such. If you're, if you're only off four weeks out of a year, you're literally, you're just settling in in Ibiza if you're you know at, at week four you're just starting to get your tan you're getting your groove now you're feeling comfortable I mean how do people survive that and many people work less by choice they work more sometimes so I'm wondering is it our because we're, we're going to come to something I find very fascinating which you, you say people's exhaustion is not their fault mm -mm. so Tell us, show us, teach us about that. How can we stop burning out? Well, gracious. So the first thing I will say is that um, four weeks is super generous in my world. The most most Americans get is, is three. Um, and that was one of the, like, I remember moving to the UK for the first time and hearing that people got like nine, nine to 12 months for maternity leave. And like, you could have knocked me with a feather because there's not, there's not any, any government mandated maternity leave here in the States or paternity leave. Um, I'd never heard of it before, really, honestly. I, I moved there for the first time when I was 21 for a long period of time. I did some study abroad stuff when I was younger, but you don't pay attention to anything when you're on study abroad. You pay attention to other things when you're on study abroad. Um, but when I like proper lived there, I remember meeting somebody who was maternity cover and thinking, I don't even know what that phrase means. Like, what, what are you talking about? Um, so when we kind of started looking at it from an American perspective, uh, 
Americans have decided that, and this is programmed from um, truly a group of folks that came over who were kicked out of England for being annoying um, and separatists. They called the Puritans. Mm -hmm. They came over and they set up American society as it is. And they had this, they had a lot of very specific theology and they were a, a, a separatist movement from, from uh, Protestant churches. But one of the things that is stuck around is the belief that you are only a good person if you work really hard. That you cannot be, that that hard work, your work ethic is tied to morality. And that may, as you're listening, sound totally normal to you. It's something that exists in other places in the, than the United States. It definitely exists in England. It doesn't exist necessarily in some other parts of the UK as strongly as it does in parts of England. Um, but there is a deep belief in a lot of Western kind of cultures that work is what makes you a good person. And this comes from a lot of Pro deeply Protestant teaching. There are in other, in other countries, you guys have more government mandated rest and more government mandated so social safety nets. In the United States, one of our delightful features is that we have to have gainful, gainful full-time employment to get health insurance. And so when you combine this, those kind of two things that we morally believe you're only a good person if you work really hard and you have to have a job to have health care, we, we have a particular toxicity. And that's, I will admit, where most of our research has been. I'll also say that globally, the most recent statistic I've heard is that globally burnout costs about $2 billion a year. So it's happening everywhere. But we took America as a case study because what's happening here happens in lesser or greater extents everywhere else. And the core of it is this deep belief that you uh, are only a good person if you work really hard, that working really hard means doing it all alone, and that you can rest when you're dead. Those are three of the core beliefs that honestly the United States was founded on even before the founding fathers showed up and you know all, even bef when we were still a british colony and we, even before we were a colony honestly back before we committed mass amounts of genocide to the indigenous people th this is what america was was those three things and the the kind of crappy thing for us as humans is that those are the tenets of capitalism and so that's the driving global religion. That's the driving global system right now is capitalism. And we can have all the conversations about what stage we're in and if it's collapsing and what's going on. But fundamentally, everybody who's alive right now has been raised in capitalism. So it's incredibly countercultural for a half a minute to think, gosh, I'm tired. So why it's not your fault is that you've been raised to simply be a body in a machine that makes money. So it's not your fault. There are things you can do to combat it on an individual level. But part of the burnout conversation that was making us real grumpy is that absolutely every single resource we could find was focused on how to get out of it on an individual level. And there was a lot of, well, you're, you're burned out. Here's how to fix it. And we wanted, it's like, the social work adage of you get to a river and there's a lot of people in it and pe some people are throwing life preservers and that's amazing. We need life preservers, but we also need the people to hike up the river and figure out why the heck everyone's in the river. And so Aaron and I decided to hike up the river and figure out why everyone's in the river. And there's lots of beautiful tips. Once you're in the river, we have a, a, uh, kind of model we call the four R's that work really well for us. Um, and there's lots of other ones out there, but from our perspective, the four R's kind of marry that cultural, countercultural stuff, the recognition that all of this is hard because you are programmed, taught, paid for, your livelihood is dependent on believing that your, that your worth as a person is tied to your monetary value to a corporation. So any instinct you have to center your personal life is judged as wrong, feels weird. You feel a lot of ways about it because you've been programmed to think differently. 
And anytime I just said humans have the capacity to change, but you have to want to. So in this, you have to want to be different and it's hard work and it's a practice. So the four R's for us are rest, rejuvenation, realignment, and reconnection. And rest is sleep and like physical rest. I always make the jokes. Like, I know this is terrible news for everybody, but you do need to sleep. Like I like spoiler alert. It's, it's hard, but it's also somehow one of the things we're all really bad at. So buy the fancy pillow, get a sleep study done, talk to like, see if melatonin works for you. Like you need sleep. And so if you're not getting it consistently, introducing a practice of sleep is one of the first steps possibly to doing that. But there's other ways to rest. There's other ways, there's other ways to rest, but rest is only one component of burnout prevention, mitigation, and recovery. The other three are the ones we don't hear a lot of other folks talking about. And so one is rejuvenation. You need to do things that bring you joy. Joy and happiness are non-negotiable parts of the human experience. So taking the, like, I, I find joy in um, the sport of baseball. I find joy in listening to Taylor Swift. <laughs> I find joy in going to Disney World. I find joy in being with my family. So if I just focused on burnout prevention as like doing rest, yoga, and bubble baths, the way a lot of the internet tells you to do it. I would be missing out on these things that also prevent burnout, which is how do I have fun? Fun, this thing that capitalism tells us we're not supposed to have, is a huge part of remembering who we are as human beings. We're meant, we're allowed and we're supposed to. Joy is important. The third one is realignment, which is also remembering who you are in the universe. This is the spiritual one, not religion, not anything to do with that. If you are a religious person, probably your religious system has some sort of practice that sounds like Sabbath. So practicing that is very important. Taking those principles, regardless of your faith system, really the principle of the principles of Sabbath are that you have to stop because you're not the center of the universe. You aren't, you aren't it. The tides will come in whether you're there or not. The sun will rise or set whether you're there or not. So doing something on a consistent basis that reminds you that you are a child of the universe, that you are important but not imperative, is a really, really key part of this. And the fourth is reconnection. One of the lies of the world is that you are you should be doing a lot of this alone. And that's a lie. We have to need other people. You know this as well, Shaw, as a therapist, like we are biologically determined to be with other people. and the current modern society where everybody lives behind fences and we all kind of, there's not a lot of common social areas anymore. And we're kind of taking those away from teenagers a lot too. We're forcing them just to stay in their bedrooms a lot and all those kind of things. The modern loneliness epidemic, which is a very, a huge problem that I don't think we're talking about enough. If a quick way to be burned out is to have nobody you can do life with. So those four things, so when you cultivate practices of rest, rejuvenation, realignment, and reconnection, burnout can be mitigated, prevented, recovered from wherever you are in that journey, because that will help you do things like actually take all your vacation time and negotiate maybe differently in your next job, how things are going to look set boundaries with your families and friends, set boundaries with your phone usage, decide that you're going to be a different person on the internet than you are right now. All those kind of four pillars can help you help you start centering a different life because that's what preventing burnout really looks like is living a different life than you're living. Yes, and that I, the way you laid it out there, perfect. And that really does tie into, if you want it, you have to get it. You have yeah. to go after it. Once you accept that it's not your fault because you've been programmed in this way, then change it, do something about it. Yeah. And isn't it interesting as kids, I know a lot of children didn't do this, but a lot of children used to just go outside and look for the other kids and then they find a stick and kick it around for hours and, they were happy and yelling and shouting and laughing. And I mean, you give my niece like a towel. She's four. 
you give my niece a towel and she becomes anything from a superhero to a queen and she will just go. Um, she will just go. Yeah, we are, we are, I mean, I can rant about modern education systems for probably a solid three hours conservatively. Um, school is often taught to kind of wring our creativity out of us. Um, but yeah, if we could all go back to, if you just watch kids play, Play is so much more important than we ever give it. I don't know why we stopped playing as an adult. My guess is the the industrial revolution, <laughs> but like, um, we got to play. We got to play. Playtime is huge. And that is sociability, uh, getting other, listening, getting other people's thoughts. It gets you out of yourself as well. So that you're not just sat with yourself, your thoughts. Yes, that's important, but it's important to allow other people's stuff in too. And you can yeah. reject it. We don't always have to agree with everyone. No, but, but you should know. At least allow it. Yes. And it creates, you know, you talk about inclusion as well. And it does create a more, I suppose, antiquated or perhaps more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Joined. I'm trying to get to it join society where we're not cohesive is the word we use a lot yes yeah that's it thank you and you know it, it will create that it will help to create that i believe so good stuff I, oh go ahead yes no i was just gonna i think you know we always say that people don't change their minds through shame and statistics oh they yeah. change their mind through stories and relationships yeah. and the number of times that we've that, I mean, like just in life, but also in, in data we collect, somebody will say, well, I used to think, and then I met, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I used to think, and then I watched this documentary. I used to think, and then I read this book. Mm -hmm. We need other stories than our own. It's just like you and I were saying a little while ago with kiddos, we need to interact with people beyond our biological determined settings because the world gets richer and wider and so do our lives and the wider our lives get the easier they cohese with other people's lives yeah that's a really good point now are these four aspects in your book because you're an author congratulations you're a co-author thank you it's the culture of burnout why your exhaustion is not your fault <laughs> and it's available now the link will be in the show notes so what prompted uh, you and your partner to write this book? Honestly, it was Aaron's and my life in Northern Ireland. Um, and we did our doctorates there, um, which is obviously a very high pressure job, um, a very isolating job. It's uh, a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of self, self uh, doubt, a lot of, not a lot of support. It's, it's a hard job. It's a hard job. I'm not saying that it's the hardest job in the world. Just saying it's hard. Um, and doing it in a culture away from your own uh, is also fascinating and sometimes challenging because you got to create a very ad hoc support network to get you through it. Um, but the the longer that we were in town and the longer that we were there, the the it was building on. I first spent a year there, and she spent a time there before Northern Ireland before our PhDs. I first lived there when I was twenty one. And I was coming from hyper productive parts of the US and um, was definitely raised in a part, I was raised just, you know, about an hour and 20 minutes south of New York City, for those of you um, anywhere familiar and outside of Philadelphia, which is very much a time is money circumstance. And I was raised in a family business with an entrepreneur for whom time really was money. And we had a deep responsibility to our employees and we worked really hard and my dad worked really hard, but it wasn't that he worked really hard. It was that he worked a lot too. It was both. Um, and I, you know, there were times like that he'd be up at four o'clock in the morning to drive to something and he never, you know, he was always at our events and always at our things, but he was exhausted and like, and, and it was a different experience than having a dad who might've just worked a nine to five. It was, it was a different experience. So I get to Northern Ireland the first time I lived in a, in a village outside Belfast and the first day of work and they took a tea break. I like lost my mind. I couldn't fathom why we were stopping. Like there were things to do. And then everyone stopped, everyone stopped for lunch. I had never not worked through a lunch break in my life. 
And I mean, like I was, I am the queen of eating at my desk. Like it's just what I've done. And, and um, I mean, I took breaks when I worked at an amusement park, but like we were in an office job. Why are we stopping to chat with each other when here's the whole list? And I am sure I was a horrible person to those coworkers. I'm so sorry to everybody within the sound of my voice because I was legitimately confused. Like very honestly, this didn't occur to me that humans could do this. And as I watched that whole year, did we get less done numerically? Sure. Sure. I mean, there the, there were less hours to get to-do lists done. Did the work, was the work any less impactful? Absolutely not. Were the relationships richer for sure? And while I had wonderful, beautiful support and relationships when I was growing up, I went to a, a, I was part of a very active church when I was growing up and it was great. In the US, if you're not in that kind of dedicated community, it's very hard to find, you know, other, other connections. And here I was just working for a nonprofit. I mentioned to somebody at work that we didn't, have a tumble dryer and it was very strange to me to dry things on my radiator I was I was still getting used to how long it took my jeans to dry like it was just something that was strange and we get back from work the next day and there was an extra tumble dryer there was a, a new tumble dryer in our in our laundry room with a note that said I had a spare one heard you needed it that's knocked my socks off like I just remember sitting down on my couch and crying because I had never never experienced anything like that so the and then I moved back to the States. I entered into two master's degrees, flung myself back into 120 hours a week and couldn't really understand why I didn't like my life as much as I liked my life in Belfast. So moved back to Northern Ireland, did, did Belfast for five years. Aaron and I would joke all the time that Northern Ireland was allergic to productivity. There were so many things we couldn't get done. Um, just uh, like I had to go to five different stores when in the States I would go to one, like all of this kind of stuff where it's like, I just spent five hours of my Saturday trying to find a plunger. <laughs> like, why did this take so long? Um, but at the same time, whole afternoons of my life were spent with people and folks just kind of, you know, even in a, t even in a place that is very skeptical and divided and has a lot of cultural baggage and a massive amount of cultural trauma there were so many people that just said oh you need somewhere to be for christmas do you need some do you oh you do you have a couple of, do you have you know want to get tea this afternoon colleagues that would stop everything that they were doing to listen to what was going on and so then i moved back to the states and once again it was 120 hours a week and um which was just kind of how my life worked and how, and how it made the most sense to me. And about a year after moving home, I used, I started saying, I'm so tired. My hair is tired. Everything is tired. I am just tired, but I'm going to keep going. Cause what are you supposed to do? So I started Googling and I started reading and I started asking why, why did I, why do I miss my life so much? Sure. I miss the people. And I miss, I miss the freedom that being a student brings. And I miss some of the cultural stuff and I miss all of that, but there was something else like fundamentally, what was I missing? And what I was missing is that I wasn't judged as a good or bad person based on how much I was working. And that I was, I am here. That when I, when people ask how I am here and I say I'm busy, what I hope they're hearing is I'm important. Now, for a lot of people in Northern Ireland and Ireland and the UK, they're in the burnout culture. And I don't want to say that it doesn't exist there. For us, we weren't in it in the same way. And we saw a possible different way of existence. So we started digging and dreaming. I started doing trainings on this um, and we started kind of testing it out in a way. We would, I would talk to a room full of entrepreneurs and I would say, you know, our, like fundamentally, if you could stop right now and your business would be healthy and you could walk away, would you? And they'd all say, yes. Would, do you want to take a vacation? Do you want to take a nap? Like, like leave aside, assume everything will be perfect. Do you want to do it? And almost all of them said, yes. Or they'd say, I do, but I don't know how. And so we started this research and this question asking in 2016. Um, and we sat down and we decided to, um, after I did a couple of TEDx talks, we decided the next phase of our business was to write a book. 
We sat down to write a book about something else, honestly, because that's what we thought we were doing. And within about two weeks of talking to each other and our um, our co-researcher, her name is Eleanor, the three of us were talking about it. She's our behind the scenes uh, business ops person. Uh, we just, all, we kept looking at each other saying, no one else is saying what we're saying about burnout. No one else is talking about culture. Like we read every book we could get our hands on and watched every TEDx and TED talk and YouTube video. And we could not find anybody talking about the cultural context. So we looked at each other and said, well, we should. No one else is. So we better. So we, it, once we decided that it went really fast um, because we had been thinking about and researching and talking about it for a long time. Um, And I've traveled all a lot of different parts of the world and I've seen what work looks like in a lot of different parts of the world. Um, And so, I mean, the real true deep culprit is capitalism. (laughs) Like that's the real, that's the real true deep culprit of why we're all exhausted. But it's it's more nuanced in other in everywhere it has to be nuanced because everywhere is nuanced um so now i spend a lot of time talking about the puritans which is not something i thought i was going to do when i started this company when i started this division of my family company i did not expect to talk about these people in funny hats as much as i do um but i think when people stop feeling the shame of i'm exhausted because i must be doing something wrong I'm exhausted because I'm not setting good enough boundaries or something. I'm doing all the wrong things. I need to try this new thing that costs me more money. I need to try this cleanse or this yoga class or this spin class or this retreat or something else. They could take a step back and realize some of the context. Then they can make more informed choices about getting out of where they are. Excellent. The research itself is interesting, and you're right. I mean, people talk about burnout, but there, there's different takes on it, isn't there? And I think it all what you what you're saying is really a lot of it's programmed. We we work, we work, we work. It's cultural. It's different. There is a lot of burnout in the UK. I have had burnout before, uh, where I've left a, a, a position because of it. Um, but then I I learned through that experience that. I felt I could have, there's nothing, there was nothing else I could have done. And I was ready to ch- have a change. So yeah. I fully believe everything, I subscribe to everything you're saying. You have to want to do it. And that's when you make the change. And and your life changes. You know, I'm a testament to that. Your life changes. I had a total burnout. I burned out real hard while we were writing this. And so I always joke. If you want to really investigate your own life, write a book about yourself, like write a book about the topic. Um, Because uh, yeah, the whole time I had a really, really difficult mental health situation while we were writing this. And I would just get, like, I would say something really like I'm, you know, I'm feeling this way today. And Aaron and Eleanor would just copy and paste back things I wrote in the book to me. Like, this is, this is the state of the world. This is the state of, this is why you feel this way. Um, and so I, you know, I joke all the time, like we wrote the book where we're, we're academic experts on it, but we're fumbling along just like everybody else. Like I can give you all the data and all the theories and I can talk to you about why front porches are a part of this and like all this kind of other stuff. But the day-to-day practice of believing that I am worth rest is a day-to-day practice. Absolutely. As you and I talk, we're about to have a four-day weekend here in the United States. It's our it's our holiday of Thanksgiving tomorrow as you and I talk. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Oh, wow. oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and in years past, I definitely viewed this as a day to get more work done. Like, oh, the office is closed on Friday. I can get more work done from home. And this will be the first year in a lot of years where my schedule for Friday is to play video games. Exactly. That's it. That's my schedule for Friday. Um, and that's, that's a choice. And I'm sure I will feel guilty about it on Friday. And I will choose to say that out loud to my husband, who will remind me that part of my job is to take care of myself. And part of taking care of myself is resting and rejuvenating and therefore playing a whole lot of farming games on my computer where I pretend to run a city. Like this is this is part of it, um, that working is also resting. But yeah, I mean, no, I've been terrible at it for a really long time. It's a It's a decision to get better at it. And also feedback, go to Kristen's website, Lee, or go to all her socials. 
and just let her know about the book, what you found, what you got out of it, what resonated with you. I'm sure she'd like, she and her partners would like to. Oh, we'd love that. We'd love that. Throw the review up on Amazon. Um, you know, we love honest reviews. Um, you know, we worked real hard on this, but we didn't cover everything. And I'm getting text messages from people that are like, but what about this? And what about this? And I'll just say it's the next book. <laughs> It's, you know, it's authors love to hear what you think of their work. Never think you're bothering them. Um, you know, be kind, you can, but you know, be constructive always. So good. Excellent. So, you know, we talked about childhood a bit, but when you look back, was there, did you have aspirations? You know, our children say, I'm going to be a this or that. Yeah. Can you remember what you wanted to do or be or? Oh, I wanted to be a Broadway star. That was like, that was it. That was what I wanted to do. Um, and figured out in my mid teens that that wasn't my path, um, for a little, for a host of reasons. Um, and then I wanted, and ever since I wanted to, and even before then I wanted to work with students. I love working with students. I love, you know, it looked different. I was a youth worker for a long time. Then I wanted to be a college professor. Um, and now Aaron and I run an internship program at a university in South Carolina here in the States. So I still get to work with students. Um, but it's always somehow involved, if I'm really honest, what I wanted to be was a storyteller. I just didn't know that's what it was. I wanted to tell stories and I wanted to help people with those stories. And I wanted to serve people with stories that would help them and change them. And whatever job I attach that to throughout my life, that is the thread of what I have always chased. Um, I've had a lot of different titles and done a lot of different things. And when people ask me, you know, for stories of my life, they can get really crazy. I can't lie. I've gotten the privilege to do a lot of pretty nutty things. But when I look back at all of this, like all of the little pieces, like, getting traveling to this country for this project and doing these things what it comes down to is that i have been fascinated as a child with stories and that if i'm honest is a lot of what i feel we do now aaron and i travel all around the country and sometimes i'm alone and i'm doing solo keynotes and tedx talks and things and sometimes we're together and, and working with with corporate clients and nonprofits and trainings and all that is is stories it's saying, here's the stories that we have collected. And here's the data we found from stories. Now let us tell you a story about how your company can be different. Let us invite you in to a new way of thinking about your employees, to a new way of thinking about yourself, to a new story you can tell about your job and your employees and your way of living. And so, yeah, I mean, brought, I love theater. I'm obviously a fairly theatrical person. I did theater for a long time. If I stayed in one place long enough, I do community theater. I, I, I love it. Um, but the sports that I love sports because of the stories that they, that they are, I, I love stories. Um, and so, yeah, Broadway and then and then a, a youth worker and then a college professor. I was pretty, pretty set on that for a number of years and then I realized that I really preferred eating, which being a university and college professor does not always allow you to do <laughs> very effectively. And my, my husband, I married a, a Northern Irish citizen. I married a, a guy when I was living over here and we emigrated back to the States. Um, and when I took up a role in my family business, when we moved back, um, we weren't sure what my role was, but we knew it somehow had to do with with my training in people and storytelling. So that's why I created Abbey Research as a division of my family company, um, mm -hmm. because stories are my animating feature. Yeah, and you mentioned the companies as well. So if, if a company's out there, if somebody's listening, watching this, and they're thinking, okay, I need a bit of insight into things, they will contact you all, they do a consultation, or how would it work? Oh, for sure. So our our division is called Abbey Research. It's A B B E Y Research. You can find us at argooddoctors.com. And we're a division of a larger network of companies that my brother and I co-own. Um, and the, all of the, the companies exist to impact lives and create holistic wealth. 
So if you're listening right now and you're thinking, you know, I've got some some new hires that are really doing my head in. I have no idea how to handle this new generation. They're asking too much. They're quitting too fast. Or you've got some, you've got people who are just not, they've been signed off of work for months and months and months and months. And you're not sure what to what to do culturally to help them come back or culturally prevent other folks from being signed off forever. Um, if you're kind of asking a lot of those questions, how do I help my people be their best self? I've got a lot of work conflict. I've got a lot of a lot of drama within my department. We would love to talk to you about how we could help. Um, it's pretty quick. Just we get on a Zoom call. We love working in the UK, obviously, um, and we've worked all over the place, uh, lots of different cultures and countries. And we work a lot with multinational organizations. So people that have a lot of different cultures within their organization. Um, if you've got questions, if you have people and problems, we can probably help. And we'd love to get on a call with you to talk about what that could look like. And, you know, since we're talking about just a couple more questions, since we're talking about uh, the past and maybe your childhood, I just wonder, have you ever thought about living in a different time. If you could live in any time, past or even present, um, what would it be? No, I like now. I'm pretty happy to live, like to be born. I always joke, like we have penicillin soap and I have the right to vote. Like, so I'm pretty, <laughs> like I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with where we are. Um, there's definitely times that I would love to visit and see a day or two and what life was like. I mean, I'm a, I'm a book reader, so obviously I want to go back to when Pride and Prejudice was set for a day and see and see what that was like. And I've read I've read Bridgerton before it was a television series, so would love to see Queen Charlotte's Court and and what that would look like. Um, but in terms of living, yeah, I quite enjoy electricity and and penicillin and soap and the right to vote. So I will stay. I was born in the '80s. I'm pretty happy with it. It's where I'd stay. So. so has there been a life lesson that you've learned recently? A very oh recent gosh. life lesson. Wow, we are all doing the best we can. And was there anything that propelled you to that? A lot of little moments. Lockdown was a part of it. Um, that we hold ourselves, we hold other people to standards that they didn't ask for. We hold ourselves to standards that we can't ever meet. And what we need to realize is that on any given day, whatever your best is, you're doing your best. You're doing the best you can. And to ask people to do more than their best is unkind. And I see this a lot as an employer is when, you know, when, when we have to ask questions about something that happened at work and, and my brother and I are talking about it. One of the very first questions we ask is always are, did we set them up to fail? Did we provide the resources needed to make this decision or execute this project? It's not, did we expect too much? It's, it's more like, did what, what are our roles in this? They were doing their best. What didn't we provide for them to allow this to be successful? Like that to me is a fundamental leadership question. And so I think that's, I just think about that all the time, even on days where my, where, I mean, I'm, my marriage is over 10 years old. Like we're at that phase where we, but we know each other really well. We both adore each other and frustrate each other, like on the regular basis. And there are times that he just drives me up the wall. And I don't understand why he doesn't remember this conversation we just had three days ago. And he's always doing his best. And some days his best is real focused on work and not focused on me, but that still means it's his best. And to give ourselves and other people the grace to do their best. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's what I've come down to. I'm sure you've seen this in your work too, in our work, is that the deepest truths are the simplest, but the most impossible to put into practice. Absolutely right. Yes. And then people like yourself who have loads of experience, you know, PhDs, people do hold you and hold us or everybody out there who works to that standard to a higher standard and actually they forget the human side that we will forget things we will make mistakes we will fail you sometimes we you know these are normal everyday life otherwise we wouldn't be human no nope. no nope. and that's and that's the thing we'll say a lot to to our clients is you are a human person 
doing life with other human persons. None of us fully know what we're doing. <laughs> we are a lot of us on every, on any given day, making it up as we go along. And the best way to do it is to figure it all out together. Absolutely. And which brings us back to the start and the end of our, our interview today, but the sociability part, working together, not feeling that you're an Ar island, Ireland, I started to say, but an island, and I love Ireland, by the way, but yes, not feeling that you're an island and mm -hmm. just reaching out, finding the resources, and and it's okay to do that. You don't have to. It, it doesn't show that you're any less capable nope. by reaching out. In fact, it shows your power that you're saying, right, hands up. I really can't. You know, that's it. I, that's it. I'm drained. There's nothing else I can do. Help me. Help me. I love it when folks are like, I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. Are you good at this? I need some help. Sure. Here's my lane. Here's my zone of genius. Here's my whatever catchphrase you want to use here's what I can offer you thank you for not asking me to do this that I can't like let's just recognize what we're all good at I think this we all especially in the in the days of the internet and, and the days of social media we tend to think everything is permanent because the internet lasts forever well you get to apologize we all need to get used to apologizing and saying we were wrong something we all need to get better at um and that we all have to be able to do everything all the time because more and more of our jobs are predicated on being a lot of things at once because we keep losing colleagues and employees and, and everything else. Kristen, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. And your research is as well. I'm looking forward to the second book um, as well because I think that will be a follow-up. So I, just the research is fantastic. So I know there'll be a lot more being done about that so thank you for sharing that and viewers listeners everything will be in the show notes go and follow Kristen on all social media any last words no just thank you so much for having me uh it's been a true honor thanks so much for listening today make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss See you next time.